we now have a brilliant panel of speakers um, from a range of different backgrounds and organisations who are ready to discuss the subject of UK policy around donor conception and specifically whether it meets the needs of donors. So specifically on the panel, we have um, Petra Nordquist and uh, as, as you've already uh, met in the first, so she's in the first session. So uh, Petra is the project lead from the Curious Connections project. We also have Natalie Gamble um, of fertility law firm NGA Law and non-profit surrogacy agency Brilliant Beginnings. Welcome. We also have a welcome Lee Bayliss, a sperm donor and one half of the award-winning performance Who's Your Father at the Edinburgh Fringe uh, Comedy of Dangerous Ideas in 2019. Um, and we also have Dr Deborah Bloor, Director of Governance for Care Fertility Group um, and <coughs> excuse me, and Selina, Selina Wilkinson, Group Donation Lead for Care Fertility Group. Um, and also, I think Leah Gilman, who you've also met in the first session, is going to join for the Q&A session um, at, at the end of, of, of the panel um, discussion. Um, before we begin the panel discussion, um, for those of you not working in this specific area, we thought it would be helpful to give a bit of a summary of what current policy is in relation to information management and payment. Um, the first thing is to highlight that when donors consent to being a donor in a UK clinic, they agree to not having any parental rights of responsibilities in relation to any children who may be born from their donation. At this point, they must also consent to identifying information about themselves being made available to any person conceived from their donation who might request that information after they turn 18. Donors are not entitled to any identifying information about their recipients or children born from their donations. However, they can, they can find out the number, year of birth and sex of any children born. People are, are often also interested to know the rules on payments to donors in the UK. At the moment, clinics are not allowed to advertise financial incentives for donating, but they are allowed to make payments to cover expenses. Though you, these are usually a fixed sum of £750 per cycle for egg donors and £35 per visit to the clinic for sperm donors. Many clinics also offer egg sharing programmes whereby women are offered reduced cost IVF treatment in exchange for donating half their eggs during the cycle. Typically these programmes reduce treatment costs by half, but we've heard of clinics who offer free IVF treatment for egg sharers too. The final thing to say is that in the UK, we have a system which enables lots of different pathways to donation. The most common pathway in clinics is for donors and recipients to be anonymous to one another and matched through clinics. But it's possible for recipients to attend clinics with a known donor, someone they already know or someone they've met for the purposes of donation. There are also now thriving websites and online groups in which donors and recipients can meet and often sperm donations are made outside of clinics. Because they're made outside of clinics, donations made in this way are not subject to the same regulations. Okay, so that's a bit of context. And I know some of the questions that have been going on on the chat have been to do with that. Um, so I hope that's, that's helpful. We're going to begin the, the panel discussion now um, and we're leading um, with, uh, Petra and Leah, I think. Yeah. You need to unmute. Okay, okay. let's get that going. Okay, hello, welcome back. I hope you had a nice break. I thought it was rather wretched not to be able to have a piece of cake with everybody, but so I had a biscuit instead in my loneliness at home. But I shall talk now about policy and the donor recipient connection as something that has come out of the study. So I will give this talk, but Leah will Leah is also part of it and will be joining us later, as, as Jennifer said. So as Jennifer already said, the out of the donors, recipients and donor conceived children, only donor conceived children had the right to trace donors or trace anyone else or seek information about that other person. Um, and what I want to ask in this 10 minutes presentation is to say, might it also be relevant for policy to recognise and acknowledge to some extent uh, that there can also be a sense of connection felt between donors and recipients. This is currently uh, recognised to some extent in UK donation policy in other areas, for example, organ donation, 
where donors and recipient by mutual consent can begin a process of getting to know one another. So looking at this from the point of view of the donors that we've spoken to, we suggest that many donors experience this connection with recipients as something that is significant in its own right. So not, it's not just about the sort of the, the child uh, they hope will be sort of um, Will, will be the outcome of this connection but it's actually an important connection in its own right. Uh, so we're not the first people to notice this, the previous research have also noticed this sort of sense of connection but what we want to do in this study and in these presentations is to note that it isn't just uh, something connecting two points together if you like but it's also the set the quality uh, that lies within that sense of connection and we want to suggest drawing on Jennifer Mason's work that there, this is a, felt to be a potent connection there's some sort of charge of potency uh, within the connection between a donor and, and their recipient uh, these are quite uh, these quotes by Rachel and Louis uh, both ID release donors were quite typical within our study so Rachel said the connection that I feel the most is with the mother I would love to meet her one day uh, and in all through her account the mother was the sort of the person she spoke to it wasn't very much about the child actually it was about the mother and Louis said it's not even about the child I hope it's the parents I hope they are as fulfilled as they hope to be and as happy as they hope to be and so interviews with both our identity release donors and known donors shows a real sense of a connection that was deeply felt I should say at this point that that wasn't um, so it wasn't all donors that felt this way, but it was a significant portion of the donors that we spoke to in both of these groups. So I want to read, so for you to get a sense of what I'm talking about here, I want to read uh, Stephen's account. And Stephen was, uh, apologies, two, one out of two anonymous donors that we in, included in the study as, so, so to speak, outlier donors, to get a sense of the difference between the identity release donors that we now see and the, the anonymous donors of the past. So Stephen <clears throat> donated in the 90s or so and he, he told us uh, about coming into the clinic and he said usually his appointments would be scheduled early in the morning so that he would not sort of happen upon recipients. So this was the kind of clinic's way of, of managing them not meeting each other. But he said, um, so I'll read, I'll read this to you. I was a bit late coming in, so I was probably leaving at 20 past nine and a couple came out of the waiting room in front of me, a man and a woman. And like I said, it's a very long corridor. There were swinging doors at the end and I'm walking along behind them, about 10 feet behind them. They know that I'm there. The body language of the two people was interesting. The woman was very, just full of joy. It's the only way to describe it. She was just happy and the guy was down. And I thought, okay, I know what's happened what's gone in here. They got the results and they said, the problem is you, sir, and we have a solution, Solution, donation. And I'm a donor right behind them, walking along and he's feeling, well, we're going to have a kid, but it's not going to be mine. We get to the end of the corridor and as you do, you hold the door when someone is behind you. The woman holds the door and she looks at me and she looked right into my eyes. And there was this kind of look of absolute unconditional love and it just blew me away given I'm a complete stranger because she's thinking this man might be the father of my child that I desperately want. And it just went, nearly knocked me over. I don't remember how I, I don't know how I reacted myself. I can't remember. Um, so Stephen's account was quite a common one within, uh, within our, in, in terms of the charge, it was, it was very common that the donors would talk about this kind of sense of a of a really sort of heightened sense of connectedness with their recipients. Um, and as Jennifer Mason has written, our chair, Jennifer, has written affinities in her book from 2018. Affinities are encounters where it's possible to identify a spark or a charge of connection that makes personal life charismatic or enchants it or even toxifies it. And we found that a lot of the identity release donation, which is what I'll be talking about here, specifically be talking about because we're talking about policy, was very much uh, lying within those, those connectedness. So we, uh, through the study and what we have found, we understand this relationship as one of affinity. Um, both ID release donors and known donors spoke of this sense of connection with recipients. It was, it was often seen to be something quite ineffable, uh, sort of almost magic, mysterious. They didn't exactly know what it meant or what it was, but something inexplicable, an inexplicable sense of being connected in some way. 
and it was felt it was a connection that was felt to carry force or meaning like a a live wire, <coughs> wire, excuse me, like Jennifer writes, something that was full of charge and energy. Um, and the donors were not at all naive about this connection. Uh, they saw it as both alluring, some, some to the extent that they would go from identity release donors to becoming known donors because they wanted to form a relationship around that connection. Um, others saw it as deeply risky, that you know that it could be very positive, but it could also become problematic or even detrimental. Uh, so they didn't approach this in a sort of naive way. Before I uh, finish up, I want to give you just a, a couple of examples of how this came out in the interviews that we did. So Tess and Paige were both ID release donors, although Paige was someone who was wanting to move on to becoming a known donor and, and even um, possibly take part in a surrogacy arrangement. And Tess said, I, I just hadn't appreciated just how egg donation plays on people's emotions and how much it is. It's like gambling. It's so addictive. Like I felt part of that Russian roulette table with a couple, didn't know who they were. Similarly, Paige said, I think I kind of grieved for a woman. So she found out it hadn't worked. I think I grieved for a woman that I'd never met. And it was a very bizarre feeling. You're crying for somebody who you're never going to meet. I don't know. I don't know her name. I don't know what she looks like. And the final example was Rachel, who, uh, who I quoted also in the beginning of this presentation. And Rachel uh, come to, came to egg sharing from a very sort of long process of trying to conceive and, and have a child of her own. Uh, and throughout, as I said, throughout her account, she spoke a lot about the recipient and about being on a sort of shared journey with that recipient because she was also coming from an egg sharer egg sharer's point of view. Um, I should say that, that there were certainly accounts among egg sharers that were like this, but ID release donors who weren't egg sharers also spoke in this way about, about their recipients. So she said in this quote that I want to read you, she said, so she was someone, some, some clinics in the UK will pass on letters and little gifts from the recipients to the donors. And she was one of them who had received something from her donor. She said, the letter was just wonderful. If the house was on fire, it's something I would try and take because it's something, sorry, it really gets me. And at this point she cries in the interview. But when my son is older, I would like to share with him. And she sent me that necklace and I wore the necklace when I had my son because I just... That's what I said, I would like to meet her more than the baby. I just feel this really strong. I guess I feel like I have an affinity to her in that way we have an understanding perhaps of the journey that we've been on. Um, so to conclude, uh, or to sort of offer some sort of conclusion or, or to sort of add something to, to debates around policy. Um, although not all donors spoke in this way about their recipients, many of them did and many, many of the clinic donors that we spoke to did. And we think Jennifer Mason's framework around affinity is really quite useful here to understand not just that there is a sense of connection, but just the sheer potency and charge that is felt often to lie within that connection. Um, it's present in both the interviews that we do with known donors, that we have done with known donors and identity release donors. But of course, our identity release donors have no way of ever tracing their recipients um, as a currency stat, as the policy is currently set up. So I think we want to ask the question, should the option then be there for donors and recipients to trace one another? And can that, could that be written into policy in some shape or form? Thank you. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Petra. And hand over. Can I, can I just say, as, as, you, um, as you hand over, I just wanted to remind people that we're in the panel discussion now. Each person's having about 10 minutes to talk, and then there will be time at the end for Q&As. And we're thinking about how well does current donor conception law and policy fit donors' needs and perspectives. So sorry to interrupt. I think we're handing over to Natalie. Natalie Gamble now. If, are you here, Natalie? I am. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. It's been absolutely fascinating to hear about this research. Um, and it's a topic that's kind of very, very close to my heart. Um, I have a number of different hats. So just to give you a, a bit of context of kind of how I come at this subject. Um, firstly, I'm a lawyer who works at NGA Law and we do a lot of work with families and donors who are conceiving together, sometimes before conception, but sometimes when issues and difficulties arise further along the, the journey with known donors as well. 
Um, I'm also one of the co-founders of Brilliant Beginnings, which is a non-profit surrogacy agency. Um, and we do a lot of work with people around these connections and kind of promoting long-lasting relationships between surrogates and, and parents. Um, and I also have a personal interest in this as well. So I have two children who were conceived through donation. Um, and having conceived them in that way, I then went on to become an egg donor as well. So I'm both a donor recipient and a, a donor, as well as having a professional interest in this area. So, um, and looking at this question about law and policy and how well it fits the needs of donors, um, I think it's quite helpful to kind of almost go back to the beginning and look at where the, the, the law and policy came from. And I think the focus, you know, all the way back in 1990 and before then when the law was being formed, was very much about creating clarity and certainty. Um, people wanted to kind of put up walls between parents and donors to, you know, there was anonymity, you know, there was very clear boxes kind of on one side of the other of, of who you were. And it was very kind of clear about who were the parents and who weren't the parents. Um, so the idea was keep everybody separate and to a large extent keep it secret as well. Um, and that is, I suppose, very clean, very easy for clinics that are involved. And conceptually, it's very simple. Um, and it kind of has this, this idea that donation is something that you can do and then forget about. Everybody kind of moves on from it. It's something that's happened in the past. But I think over the decades, um, we've learned that donation is not that simple at all for anybody that's involved. It does create lasting connections. Um, and the law and policy has moved on significantly in recognising that, but I think it's not quite at the end of its journey in getting there. Um, so we've obviously had a significant movement in terms of the rights of donor conceived people to access information. Um, and I think it's absolutely right that the law has kind of focused on, on their needs. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, that there is a question around whether, you know, as Petra was just saying, the law has moved on enough to recognise the, the needs and desires of the adults involved as well in kind of managing those continuing connections. Um, so I think the world in general has become much less focused on privacy. Um, it's become more accepting of non-traditional families, of non-biological parents, of people having kind of different roles and more kind of diverse family structures. Um, and that has led to a much wider kind of change in culture around donation. Um, and I think that both parents and donors want to have more openness as well, and that the law perhaps haven't quite caught up with that. Um, and certainly from a parent's perspective, we do see that there's kind of an, an appetite to access more information. So we work with quite a lot of parents who are going overseas to places like the US for surrogacy. Um, and in the US, often if they're conceiving with an egg donor as well, they have a choice over the kind of egg donor that they conceive with, whether it's anonymous, whether it's identity release, or whether it's completely known. Um, and a lot of parents choose to have a lot more information than they would be able to get through a clinic donation in the UK. Um, and we also see the appetite for, for parents wanting more information through the numbers of recipients, particularly single women and same sex parents who are conceiving with known donors outside the regulated system. So via donor matching websites and, and forums and so on. Um, and a lot of that is driven by this desire to kind of know more about the donor from the outset. Um, that there isn't this mystery that's going to be disclosed once the child is 18. But the, the regulated system in the UK feels very one size fits all, that there's a very kind of prescriptive approach to how much information is provided and when. Um, so in terms of the perspective of donors, I think a lot of presumptions are made about what donors want. So I think it's so fantastic that this research is being done in order to, to give them a voice to. Um, and I think all policy is better when it's based on the empirical evidence of you know, what's really happening. Um, and I, I don't think that donors do all just want to make a donation and then forget about it without strings attached. And that's certainly what your research seems to have shown. Um, and I think that there is this kind of perspective of donors having much more of a, a vested interest in what's happening. Um, so just, I mean, in terms of my own experience of having been a donor, I think I went on a bit of a journey emotionally, and I wonder if this is common to other donors as well. Um, I mean, initially when I donated, I did it because I'd had my own family through donation, and it, it kind of felt like the right thing to do, that I ought to kind of give back to the system that had helped me have a family. Um, but as I got into it, it didn't feel so much like a thing to do that was selfless and then I put behind me. I felt much more of a connection with the recipients who I've, I've not met. I don't know who they were. Um, but once they were a real family with a real child, it kind of took on a, a new meaning. And I think this, this phrase of curious connections is, is very apt. I think I'm very clear that I don't feel like a parent. Um, but I don't feel like a stranger either. And I do feel connected with both the recipients and the child that they had. 
Um, so I'm interested in the future. I'm interested in what may happen, not just for myself, but for my own children as well. Um, and, you know, maybe it'll just be a curiosity if they reach out, you know, maybe it'll grow into a more meaningful relationship. Um, but I do hope that we, we have that opportunity. Um, so in terms of the law and policy and whether it fits down as well, I think there are three things that I would say where I think we could think about looking at things with more sophistication. Um, so firstly, I think recognising that donors as well have a legitimate interest in promoting openness about donor conception and encouraging parents to tell their children that they were donor conceived. So I certainly feel that you know, if the child who was conceived as a result of my donation wants to come looking for me, I want them to do that from a place of curiosity and interest. I don't want them to do that from a place of hurt and loss and a late discovery. Um, and I know, you know, we're much better about educating parents about the importance of telling children that they're donor conceived these days. But I think acknowledging that, that donors have a, an interest in that too, so that they're involved in you know, the, the donation that they've done very positively has been a positive experience for the, the child as well is very important. Um, secondly, I think there should be more inclusion and recognition of the rights of donors' children. Um, you know, as Petra was just talking about, I, I don't think there's any reason where everybody can sense why there can't be mechanisms for people to make contact with each other if they want to using the HFEA register. So at the moment, donors' own children are excluded from those mechanisms, but I don't really see any reason why they couldn't be included as well. Um, and finally, I think law and policy could be more flexible in accommodating different choices in the way that information is shared about donor conception, donor conception between recipients and donors, um, both before conception and while the child is, is young before they're 18. Um, so if, certainly from my perspective, I would have been very happy for the recipients that I donated to to have more information about me. Um, if their child wanted to contact me before they were 18, I would be very happy for them to do that. So it would be nice to have that kind of flexibility to know that those were possibilities. And I think, you know, some donors will be very happy today on a very open, known, entirely known basis. Um, and at the moment, that's something that unless it's a, a sister or a friend or, you know, someone that, that does it or you do it via a donor matching website, it, it isn't accommodated very well within the regulated system of clinics in the UK. Um, and one of the worries, I guess, about doing things in an entirely open way is that it could lead to messiness, it could lead to disputes and kind of donors overreaching their, their role, if you like. Um, and just to kind of play the other side of this, I guess, you know, that is something that we've seen in a, a legal capacity. So we have dealt with a number of cases where um, donors, typically to single women and to same sex couples, have wanted to play more of a role in the child's life than um, the parents have felt comfortable with. And that has led to disputes that have been heard in the family court. Um, but I think many of those cases, I, I mean, I would say the overwhelming majority are avoidable cases so they come from a place where there isn't a clear enough discussion at the outset about what everyone's expectations are and sometimes as well I think that it, it can be a very difficult world for single men and for gay men who want to become parents and have limited options and so some men kind of opt for donation in an, on a known basis as a kind of compromise of becoming a parent when actually really they should be looking at adoption and surrogacy if they want to have a family of their own so I think providing the right support at the right time to enable people to explore all these issues and think through what they want is very important if we do start to kind of encourage more known donation. Um, but I think the flip side is that there are real benefits too and I think where relationships remain easy and things work well um, it could be wonderful for everybody involved including the child that there is this kind of continuity of information rather than um, you know a lack of information that is suddenly then disclosed at a later date. Um, so ultimately, I think that donation is complex. I think the experience is diverse and this is hugely personal. So I think we should continue to evolve law and policy in line with the evidence um, of how people are experiencing these connections. And ultimately, you know, this isn't a cut and dried one size fits all um, experience. And so I think, you know, the law should manage and acknowledge those continuing connections better for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. That's such a useful and sensitive set of observations and suggestions. Um, I think we now move on to Lee Bayliss. Lee, are you here? I am here. I am here. Thank Hello. you very much. Welcome. So you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's important to people to know who they are 
and why do people know? I had a whole bunch of quotes, but I think you've delivered some better quotes in this session already. A couple of brief quotes. There's a half of me I know nothing about. It shook my sense of identity. My entire existence is a lie. And then, of course, you've got a more modern angle, which is the perception that if you tell me my genes, I'll somehow know who I am. This um, engulfing obsession that is taking hold of people. And... Um, after reading these statements, I think there's definitely an argument uh, that's accepted already that it's important to people to know who they are. But the nature of the technology and the current legislation doesn't always satisfy that need. So what do we do? We change things. IVF is all relatively new stuff after all. So it's understandable that we might not have got the law right coming out the gate. In terms of changing things, an earlier change um, was one that donor conceived people can find their siblings. There's something called Donor Link, which um, is a service for those conceived post 1991. So we've clearly been keeping some sort of anonymous donor identifier number, even before keeping the more recent um, identifying donor records. In my bio for today, it mentions that I did a show at the Edinburgh Fringe, which I'll come on to a little bit more later. But um, when I was prepping for this last year, I discovered Donor Link have had 13 successful link ups. So um, I was prepping last year, it could be more now. This is since 2010. Obviously, in order to use DonorLink, you must already know you are donor conceived, and then you must also register with them. I think DonorLink is an exciting idea, and they are rightly proud of what their service achieved. <clears throat> Crunching the numbers, though, um, if it's open to everyone who's donor conceived since 1991, the HFEA website suggests that there's about 2,000 donor births per year. So 13 linkups means 26 siblings have been matched out of a potential 58,000, that's like 0.04%. So I really hope more people will find out about and use this service, maybe even through hearing about it today. But we change things. We change our thinking. I said in order to use DonorLink, you must know your donor conceived. But originally, it was left up to the recipient parents to decide whether or not to say anything to the child. Now, although it's still not mandatory, it's best practice and parents are strongly encouraged to tell children from the start that they are donor conceived. So that's, that's a change in thinking that's come across. Why do they do this? Well, apart from um, some of the quotes that I had at the beginning, people have quite traumatic reactions. As I say, it's important to people to know who they are. <clears throat> One question then that we asked our audience in our show was, should it be mandatory to tell your children they are donor conceived? And for now, I'll let you all think on that point. We change things. We changed the law 15 years ago, as, as you've heard. Uh, now 18 donor conceived people can find out more about their donors and even contact them. We don't yet know the full fallout from this change. Nobody has actually reached 18 yet who was, um, who was being subject to this law. But one consequence that we do know is that very few people now in the UK donate anymore now that they can be contacted. And I don't know whether this is just something I think from watching sitcoms, but perhaps this speaks more to the culture surrounding donation that existed pre-1995 than it does about anything else. Instead, um, part of these consequences, we, in the UK, we get most of our material from Denmark. And this has knock-on consequences of its own. A popular one in the media, that if, if you search the right kinds of things, is that um, there are no donor conceptions of ginger-haired children now, because in Denmark, they used to accept donations. But when people were choosing whose material to use, it turned out, according to the Danes, there was no demand at all for, for ginger donors. Another consequence, according to the Huffington Post, is that Brexit implies a change to our import ability. Um, you can look at the article that their, their cutting headline is a shortage of sperm donors, the Brexit dilemma we didn't see coming. So this leaves us running UK campaigns to get people to donate, which um, there are people who look at this kind of thing. Ideas fronted have included um, posting adverts at football matches, etc., which I'm not so sure about. I think these may fall foul of the pre-1995 donation stigma I mentioned earlier. Anyway, yes, we continue to change things. I am a donor. I donated in 2011, but because things were changing, there were regulatory things going on, which meant that at the time, my material couldn't get used until 2013, despite they told me I was the only viable UK donor who had volunteered at their clinic for a year or so. <clears throat> and of course, maybe more change needs to come. So for example, I was a little horrified when donating, when they, uh, I discovered that I could specify not to let people of certain races and sexual orientations have my material. 
Interestingly enough, though, when I turned that on its head and I asked about religions, I was told uh, I, I, it was not possible for me to make any selection as to different religions getting or not getting um, my material. Um, I was told stricter religions, in fact, tend to sort it out within the community as a private matter. And so um, it doesn't really matter that much anyway in terms of my inquiry. But we change things. What about future change? And uh, this ties in with a lot of the things that Natalie was just saying. So as I've been saying, these issues really are important to people. <clears throat> um, and they are important to me. I donated in the first place because I really wanted my offspring to exist and be out there. And in fact, I would love to know more about them. So as you do, I put together a double act show with Sarah Chan, who is a bioethicist. And as I mentioned, we took it to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival last year. We even won an award for the most disturbing use of a prop on stage, which sounds much worse than it is. All we really did was hand a turkey based around the audience as, a, as an example. But this stuff is really important to people. And we discovered we weren't the only ones with shows on this topic. Some of the others being uh, a great deal more creative than ours. And I'll mention a little bit more about that later. In putting our show together, I wanted to explore the argument, similar to Natalie, that there's another thing which is important to people, that it's not just knowing who you are, but also knowing who you have become or what you have become. What is your legacy? And I think knowing that parts of you have carried on is equally powerful to people. As it turns out, I'm not alone. People came and talked to us after the show. Men who donated pre-1995 who find that it plays upon their minds, that they just don't know what the outcome of their donation was. They have even less information about their donation than I do. It's important to people. Interestingly, we didn't meet anybody who had been a donor in the last 15 years, but I guess that's not so surprising if there are fewer people doing it. And I note from the chat that someone's uh, suggested I, 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 I am corrected on the idea that nobody does it. Um, we, we, can, we can talk about that perhaps a little bit later. Uh, I did get to wondering whether the one-sidedness of the current law is part of the barrier to volunteers right now. Before, um, it used to be anonymous both ways, which at least is, is, is a balanced scenario. Now information flows one way, but not the other. Would people be more inclined to donate if they got to know more about their offspring? My thinking in the show, though, and really here today as well, is that these motivations, which are so important to people that the law was changed, do run both ways. Now, as with Natalie, I'm not saying this is a, an easy thing to address, and of course it would need careful thought. Plenty of comments were made in our show about the potential unhealthiness of donors just dropping in on a young person's life. Although I also note from, from some of the things that Natalie said that it's not like there aren't plenty of cases of messiness associated with the traditional way of, 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 of bringing up families and running things. This does bring me back though to my earlier question to you. One other objection that we heard in our show was that at the moment it's still possible that a donor conceived person may not have been told. And that's something that people rightly thought would make a donor being able to drop in on a donor conceived person's life quite a catastrophic event. Now, perhaps the idea of opening up the information flow in both directions is too simplistic. So we also explored a second theme in our show. And again, Natalie touched on this. If everybody involved consents, should donors be more allowed to get involved earlier? Could this help with some of the issues I've, I've identified, which were raised at our show um, regarding the simple idea of donors being able to contact donor conceived children? In the same way that telling people from the start that they are donor conceived is now regarded as, as good, could we minimize that potentially jarring, terrifying meeting at age 18 if instead more information had been shared throughout the process? At the end of the day, even without the law allowing more information flow surrounding private healthcare or NHS donations, things are still changing anyway though. We can already, as, as Natalie said too, we can sort it out amongst our families, our friends, or um, <clears throat> even, as I found out, religious communities. But now the internet, as Natalie said, offers us even more ways to do it. That You've got co-parenting websites which introduce donors to prospective parents, and there are various levels of involvement you can have. So you can donate and be done with, and you can run through all these levels all the way up to, I wanna be involved in a three-parent family. A criticism of these sites is the lack of legal protection that they offer because you may then be liable for any children that are conceived. But on the other hand, the difference in information flow level may appeal to donors who think it is more important to know 
um, either the donor can see children or the families, um, more about that than they would on the NHS anyway. I find it interesting to consider that technology is allowing us to get around the conception problem, but by default, what we've tried to do with it is reinforce the way we think families should be beforehand. So I've, I've heard it said that changes in technology do not really bring, uh, these changes in technology don't really bring problems, they only bring opportunities. So is it the case that when taking these opportunities, we should look to something new rather than propping up um, the status quo? Should your opportunities necessarily herald change? This is perhaps a timely question to ask. So for example, uh, look at coronavirus and this meeting. Things have changed. I'm almost certain not everything will go back to the way it was now that we've experienced some of the other possibilities that are out there. Another example, um, we're seeing our ideas of modern families changing with society. Again, Natalie sort of alluded to this. Single parenting is much more accepted now than it was 50 years ago. Single sex couples are recognised as parents. And whether it's recognised in law or not, people are out there forming three or more parent families. The idea of the nuclear family is kind of a, a relatively, relatively recent concept anyway. If you go back far enough, you have children being raised by family units which call into play multiple generations or even a village or a tribe, uh, that kind of thing. I think at the end of the day, as long as we're doing better than TV sitcom Shameless, we're doing okay. So is it right that we should rate these issues with such importance? For example, I didn't meet my own father until I was 16, and it, it answered some of my questions, sure, but it, it didn't answer everything. And it makes me wonder, is, the, is it that it's important to know who you are, or really is it that it's important not to not know who you are, especially when you think everyone else around you does know who they are? And that's, uh, that's something that, that, that I, I, I ponder over. In the meantime, if I, if I wanted to, I can, of course, make other efforts to find my offspring, especially if it turns out that they or their parents are also interested in finding me. For example, I could do an Edinburgh Fringe show and hope that word of mouth reaches them. Actually, friends and family do periodically message me every time they hear of someone being donor conceived in Manchester and they let me know, oh, I may have found one of your kids. Or a local newspaper maybe might be interested in my story and who knows, one day I, I might look into that. But beyond me taking out personal ads, we also have genomic medicine coming to the fore and associated services. For example, 23andMe, where you stuff a sample and you get access to their database to find out if there's anyone in it that is related to you. Hi, Lee. Sorry okay. to interrupt. We need, we need to uh, move on. I'm uh, nearly done. I'm draw nearly to done. a close. Yeah, I'll you. draw to a close. <clears throat> so... Um, yeah, uh, you, uh, these, these things are coming into more common use because this stuff is important to people. So people are f starting to find each other anyway. Uh, one of those shows I mentioned at the Fringe, for example, was about a woman who found a half-sister and went from there to a genetic father. Uh, but then there was a drama because he didn't want to know and he was upset that his, because his donation was supposed to be anonymous. Someone else I work with has found cousins and is trying to um, get her parents to use the service as well so they can find out which side of the family they're from. But I'll finish off um, with a, one last question that we asked in the show about who should have a say what I do with my genes. When I donated, there was a required counselling session and they asked to talk to my partner, but not to any members of my genetic family. And yet, as I just mentioned, my actions have created grandchildren, nephews or nieces and cousins. So I had to break it to my parents that they have eight grandkids that they will very possibly never meet. And as you can imagine, it turns out that even they think it is important to know. Thank you very much for, for bearing with me and uh, that's me. Thank you very much. Okay, we need to move on. Um, so the ne our next speaker is uh, Deborah Bloor. Deborah, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Lovely, okay. Hi. Welcome, Hi. your 10 minutes starts now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting and I feel a bit chastened because um, I, I approach this topic from a completely different angle from almost everyone I've heard speaking today. But what you've said to me today is so interesting. And my colleague, Selena Wilkinson, is also on the call and she'll be answering questions later. Um, I'm Director of Governance at Care Fertility, so we recruit donors, both sperm and egg donors, uh, and we do surrogacy in our clinics across the care group. Um, and it's my job to make sure that the clinics follow the law and implement all of the policy and legislation around donor recruitment. And when I was first given the topic, I was thinking, oh, crikey, you know, this is, this is quite a difficult one. What, what do I think about it? But it, it was a fantastic opportunity for me to think about 
how the practical things that we do impact on donors. And these are the things that the legislation and policy require us to do. But I've looked at this from a completely different angle from the rest of the speakers. And it makes me even more convinced that we have to think carefully about um, the policy and legislation around donor recruitment. So as an example, I looked at all of the, the ways or the potentially the barriers and hurdles we put in before donors to before they can actually donate their gametes. So uh, I'm sure many of your or many of the audience will know the, the first thing we do is ask our donors about their medical history. We're required to do that. The law requires us to do that and policy. And when we do that, we ask our donors, it may not be across the group, I'm speaking for care fertility, but we ask our donors to fill in a really complex medical history form. And when I thought about how that might impact on our donors, I was thinking that we're asking, we're asking a lot of them to know about their family history. These are questionnaires that ask about questions about a donor's multi, multi-generational history. And I was thinking about my own children and you know, they, they have only knew their maternal grandmother as a very elderly lady with Alzheimer's. We would ask our donors to tell us what their grandparents, what conditions, what illnesses are running through their families so that we can assess whether they may have a genetic condition that we might think could be passed on to their future children. My children wouldn't know that my mother-in-law actually had breast cancer at a very early age. They only saw her as an elderly lady and knew she died in her 90s of Alzheimer's disease. So I felt that the, I, I, this, doing this talk and thinking about it made me imagine that we're asking a lot of donors. And also, you know, we are, we're potentially, when we ask in a clinic questions about a donor's medical and potentially genetic history, we're kind of expecting that they know stuff or they know the significance of stuff. Another example, um, so we do, not only do we ask people about their medical history, and of course that's really important because first and foremost, we have to know that the, when we, when we take um, the, the gametes of a donor, particularly an egg donor, of course, who's going through quite an invasive procedure and taking medications, our first priority has to be to protect that donor's health and well-being. We must never, ever endanger their health in, in, in taking their eggs. You know, it's an amazing gift they're giving to us. And we have to respect and make sure that we, we protect them and we care for them. But then we ask them about their medical history and we do some basic genetic screening. But there's a disconnect here, I feel, between, um, you know, we, we've, we've talked about um, how it feels perhaps through this work and this this conference that maybe the odds are stacked in favor of the recipient or particularly the donor conceived child and the rights of the donor are, are somehow um, not 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 the rights of the donor but the experience of the donor perhaps isn't given the right um, it doesn't have, we don't have the right balance and I, I think that comes through with with some of the inv invasive tests we do on our donors there's the law that requires us to screen our donors to make sure they don't have infectious conditions that can be passed on to their future children or in fact the recipients. But the way the policy around that law has been um, shared and implemented means we, you know, at, at a very basic level, we have to screen our donors a lot and we, we take a lot of blood from them. It's, it's very invasive and we're, again, we're putting barriers in their way. And most recently, the HFEA, we, we, the, the previous speaker, mentioned the difficulty when we the, the, the difficulty of brexit and our regulator has decided to diverge from the path um, of europe in terms of what screening is required for our donors and we now have to quarantine our donors for three months before we can um, release their gametes for use and retest them after that three months so we're expecting our donors to come to our clinics more frequently because of the way our law the legislation has been interpreted and moved into policy it's not legislation but moved into policy now and i i felt that that was potentially something we we could maybe it ought to challenge and the fact that we have to we have to do so we do this screening um i i the scientist in me questions the um the validity of um, how, how much extra protection the screening offers for our uh, recipients or the donor conceived child. And I think a, a 
sensible debate about balancing the needs of the donor and the recipient and future children is would be really valuable and finally we we talked about um there's been lots of talk about the lifelong connection that feeling that um link that i think it's amazing what what our donors do one of the things that we find happens quite sometimes not frequently but on occasion we learn from our donors we ask our donors to tell them to tell us if they become aware that they are the carriers or in having their family a serious genetic illness which can be inherited because we talked about genomic medicine and we then might share that information with the recipients of donor gametes or in fact with the so they can share it and use it to make sure the health of their future the with their of their children is protected but we also sometimes have children born through treatment with the gametes that we've from donors we've recruited who report genetic abnormalities in their children um, or potential genetic conditions and then we go back to the donors if they've consented for us to contact them and share information with them that can be really really hard for them to process and understand and clearly it might help them with their own reproductive health and and decisions but the, we've talked about the lifelong emotional connection but from my perspective there is there is a, a lifelong connection through if you like that responsibility for the future genetic well-being of your children and in fact the donors and i think that's um that's something which perhaps we as clinics recognize and take for granted and i'm interested that none of the donors have that have been interviewed or, or maybe it hasn't been part of the questioning but i feel that we put a lot of burden on our donors um, and we have to we have to make sure that we support them at absolutely every step of the way and we're there for them constantly and i won't say any more thank you thanks very much deborah Wow, what interesting um, uh, different perspectives we've had on the on this panel. Um, there are some questions coming in. I also think it's um, we, we've got uh, 20 minutes or so, I think. I also think it's important that members of the panel can address um, questions to each other if they would like to. So please, please do that because it's it's nice to have a discussion between members of the panel. I wonder if I can just start start things off um, by picking up something that was asked in the earlier session that um that that we didn't have time to ask um which is about um the language of morality and rights and and responsibility and and how how helpful that language is where it comes from you know how that helps in terms of um helps or otherwise in terms of the fit between um, law and policy and and donors needs and perspectives and so on so I wonder if that's something that panel members would be willing to um, oh I've just lost you all there you are sorry <laughs> panel members would be uh, willing to address um, is that something you feel you could address yeah could we start with Petra You need to unmute Petra, you're muted. There we go. Could I have a moment to think about that? Is there, is there someone else who would like to go ahead? I'm sorry, I checked a difficult uh, question. No, it's fine. It's all right. I just thought I need that to have a moment. Anyone else? Unmuted speak. Lee. Uh, well, um, I don't really know whether or not there's much I can throw in on that, but um, certainly from my my perspective when I went to be a donor, um, because there's this mandatory counselling that you have to do as part of it, quite a lot of um, import was placed upon upon the morality of what I was doing and the uh, the importance and, 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 and all that kind of thing. And it, it was interesting because none of that was really the reason I had been. Um, I, I'd, I'd come to a sort of position where I wasn't going to have children with my partner and um, and yet I still wanted my, my offspring to put there. So, so to have them confront me with all this kind of, oh, you're doing such a great thing and, and roll out the red carpet and shake my hand. And, and I was really quite bowled over by it. I'd never considered it at all. And it, um, the more I did think about it, the more I did sort of come away feeling like a good Samaritan. But uh, I don't know whether or not the, uh, there's any, any more I can say about, the, uh, about wh whether or not we ought to, to, to do these things. It just, uh, mm -hmm. it was very powerful. 
Thank you. Um, Miss uh, Deborah here. Uh, sorry, I can I can I, do you want me to say something? Yes, please. <laughs> sorry. Um, I think it, it it's so fascinating to have hear these discussions from the perspective of, of of someone who works with donors all the time, recruiting them. You know, people like Lee, and um, I think for us as um, the, the law itself brings in this notion of morality or actually not law but policy so as we've talked about you you spoke about at the beginning jennifer that we have um legis uh, a policy on how much a donor can be reimbursed uh and that's very very strict but the hfa when they speak to us as licensed clinics there's a certain angle where they they really don't want us to recruit donors who might potentially be doing it just for the money. And so as clinics, we might, I think, and, and speaking, Lee mentions having, having to speak to a counsellor. I think our clinic would recommend that people speak to counsellors, not because we want to explore the morality, the reasons, their motivations for giving a donation, but, sim but because Sometimes there are elements to don donation that our counsellors are much more expert than we are in helping people understand how it might feel. For example, if someone's sharing their gametes or um, you know, how might they feel if, if the person they share with establishes a pregnancy and they themselves don't. You know, there's lots of stuff that you know, me, the scientist, I, I wouldn't even begin to know how to guide people. But I think that morality question is influenced by the law and policy a little because of this notion that it some, would be somehow wrong for a donor to do it for the compensation. Thank you. Would anybody else from the panel like to come back on that one? Yeah. yeah I, I, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Selena. No, Hi, it's fine. Um, from Care Manchester, um, working with Deborah, and yeah, I get to see um, a significant amount of donors, and it's really interesting. We can't hear you very well, Selena. What you say. Selena, we can't we can't hear you. I'm afraid. I think we need to move to somebody else for the moment. You're slightly, you're too glitchy. Can I go to Petra, and we'll come back to Selena? Sorry, we can't. Okay, so uh, Selena, you might want if you if you. Okay. I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, no. I think it's terrible Wi-Fi in the Care Manchester Clinic. Maybe is it? Okay. I, I, I actually muted Selena because it was because we couldn't hear. So, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure where that noise is coming from. I've sent her a message to explain why. Have you? Thank you so much. I really didn't want to do that. Please apologise. <laughs> we wanted to hear what she was saying. Um, sometimes turning the video off can help the connection. Yes. So if she can do a sort of a, just a, a voice thing, that could help maybe. Uh, but just to say that we have uh, those, certainly that morality comes through really clearly in the study. And Leah is actually the one out of the two of us who's written mostly about uh, donors um, kind of feeling the need to explain themselves and the emphasis being really strongly on doing it for the right reasons and sort of the feeling like you need to present the right reasons and particularly sperm donors needing to some way navigate the charge that they are not doing it for the right reasons and sort of um, and the narratives are very much about um, presenting themselves as a moral human being through navigate sort of the, the, the charges that can be made against sperm donors and, and the reason why they might be donating so it's definitely a really strong sort of findings in in the study. I don't know if Leah is here and if she wants to add anything to that. I've just, just tried to unmute yeah. myself, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I mean, absolutely agree with all that. And then just coming back to the original question, I think, which was about whether this language around morality and rights is, is useful. And I suppose, in many ways, I, I don't feel completely qualified to answer that question as to whether it, it's right or wrong. It's kind of an ethical, ethical question. But I think I would say, off the back of what Petra said, I think one of the things that, 
it would be good to not have is the assumption that it's I think often that a need the need to account for why you've become a donor um, and this is possibly more true of the sperm donors that we spoke to where there can be more of a stigma around it is the assumption that you need to be doing this for the right reasons and you might be doing it for the wrong reasons and if you are that's quite problematic so that kind of um then there's a particular need to give an account in this situation to prove that you are the people who are doing it for the right reasons and that therefore this is a good thing that's going to have a good impact on people and the world um and then but then yeah i forgot my got my train of thought here but yeah but also at the same time to, i don't think you can remove these these things are in tr things that are these are questions about personal relationships, about um, responsibility for the actions that you've taken in your life. And they are things that we, we consider to be deeply moral questions. Um, and so it's sort of perhaps inevitable that people are going to talk about them in, in those ways. But the presumption, this, this real, the stigma that maybe this, sometime, this, this conversation sometimes starts from is maybe less helpful. Um, mm. Um, and something that could be addressed. Does that make some sense? <laughs> it does. Thank you, Leah. Yeah. And, um, I was just, yeah, I was just going to chip in as well to say that I think, you know, donors often come from a place and we see this with surrogates as well, where they feel under a lot of pressure to be doing something for someone else and for it to be very selfless. And I think there's a danger in that, that they kind of, you lose yourself a bit in that and that you don't feel that you have the voice to say what you want and what you need from the process. So I think for people who are supporting donors and surrogates, it's kind of really important to give them the space to be able to say, you know, if they want more information or if they, you know, to, to be able to respond to their, their feelings and their, their wishes as a valid participant in this, they're not somebody that has to do it completely selflessly and their feelings do matter. Thank you. Can I, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of big, tough general question that's come in that I would like to pose to you all and follow it with two sort of more specific kind of perhaps examples of, of ideas. So the, the big hard question is that we've talked a lot about felt connections in donation. How might these actually translate into policy and practice? What opportunities and difficulties do you see? And if I could just, set, just read out these other two questions, um, which are, could there be something like the adoption contact register where donors and recipients can register their willingness to share contact details and if both parties agree the details can be handed out uh, and then another comment there are also voluntary contact registers in some australian states where donors recipients dc adults and family members on both sides all have the right to register right from the start could we learn a lot from them those those questions and comments were from debbie kennett and marilyn crawshaw so I wonder if you could address the big question and also maybe take in those, those, those more specific examples. Um, uh, and I, would, I think rather than picking on anybody, I'll let you unmute when you feel ready to, answer, to address that question. But it would be good if everybody from the panel felt they could address that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, we ought to remember that in the UK, we already have a register. So, you know, the information about which donors, you know, conceived with which recipients is already sitting there in a publicly held register. So, you know, the mechanisms for allowing people to consent to that being disclosed ought to be reasonably easy. And, uh, you know, I realise that register doesn't apply to pre-1991 um, donations, but it could. So I think, you know, if the effort and the funding and the support was there, it's, you know, not a terribly difficult policy change to make. Thank you. This this was a question that we talked about a little bit when we did our show as well, and we and we, we sort of we we suggested the idea of this uh, of, a, of a two way register, and we said that practically at the moment, because the law is the way it is, um, all that means is that the the donor conceived person has a, an indication as to whether or not the donor would would like to be contacted or not. It doesn't really do anything for the donor in terms of facilitating that communication. It just means that the donor can see person has an idea whether or not they would be welcome if they got in touch but i think some of that is already kind of covered in the in the pack that that donors are encouraged to fill out when they when they make their donation at the moment so for example i was i was encouraged to say a little bit about my biography and family history but also 
um, to write something to any potential children that might be conceived um, that they could read first in, in order to decide whether or not to contact me. And, and uh, hopefully from, from what I wrote, it's clear that I would like them to, but I guess such a register would be like a, a green light, if you like, for someone wanting to know whether or not it was a good idea for them to contact their, their donor. Thank you. I don't know. So before I worked, sorry. Deborah, Deborah. So before, before I worked with care, I did work with the regulator. And so I do know the law moderately well. I, at my own concern, much as I would like, I, I think it would be really valuable to redress the balance of the right of information for donors. I think it's a change in the law that's needed around disclosure and changing the law is, is tricky. And I think it would take us a while to achieve that. I don't think it's as simple as a policy change. Um, I know I was working for the HVA when the decisions were made to release pen portraits, for example. And I also know that when, when that was first um, explored, the impact of allowing, because originally the pen portraits and, the, and the, the, the messages that Lee was just talking about were only released to children. Um, but then it was, they were made available to the parents of, of donor conceived children with the idea that they could use those to, to build a story with a donor conceived child about their, about their donor. But it was clear that the messages sometimes given the advent and the progress made by social media could sometimes lead to donors being identified. So I, I think it's, it's going to be difficult. I don't, that means we shouldn't do it and we shouldn't press for those changes, but I think it would require a change in the law. <clears throat> Thank you. Petra. Yeah, so I haven't sort of formed a fully, this isn't a fully formed sort of view on this, but a difficulty, and I kind of hate myself for saying this, but the difficulty that I can imagine is that the law at the moment seems to be coming so very much from the point of view of, um, of offering children the right to make choices. And the, the emphasis is so much on the donor conceived child. And it's very much a sort of, um, almost that child is, is imagined in a sort of dyadic relationship with the donor and finding information about the donor and it seems to me like what we're talking about is almost a sort of <laughs> wholesale shift in how donation is considered in law and and stepping away from that emphasis on children's needs that that so much um in, in this law is doing to sort of recognizing that we're talking about networks that this isn't a dyadic relationship actually other people are also involved uh, and I suppose as part of that, the difficulty might be that a recipient might well want to find out information about the donor whilst also keeping the donation secret to their child. So that can be also, I can imagine, secrets along the way, new kinds of secrets potentially. Um, that, that, yeah, so I just want to kind of throw that out there. It is something that I, I don't have an answer for. These are just sort of things that I imagine might come our way. Um, I just, Leah, I, I wondered if I could come in and I just thought, and this is sort of thinking uh, as we go, rather than again, a sort of well thought out uh, suggestion, I suppose. But I was thinking about, uh, often a lot of the suggestions we're using about, you know, maybe a, a voluntary contact register. And I, I think these are all good suggestions, um, but they're kind of like adding something on to the current system that we have, which is that donors, recipients turn up at a clinic on their own and then they might make the links after the donation. Whereas I wonder whether the model that's happening outside of clinics, it can actually be helpful in thinking about how we can do this kind of thing, whereby no donors and recipients are finding each other at, outside of the clinic and then Obviously, in lots of these case, case, cases with sperm donation, they never go to the clinic. Um, but they could, they could, and there could be some way of bringing them in without it being incredibly expensive and all the rest of it. But also, there are egg donors who go down that route and then present at the clinic as a known, a known donor recipient couple, if you like. Not a couple, but, you know, people who are doing this together. Um, and I just wondered if that might that people could you could you could still potentially have donors coming to a clinic saying I want to donate and then there may be then way a way of directing the model um but I wonder if there's some way that you can kind of bring that approach in and it then actually doesn't require a change in the law because that you're not giving any information it's your you're you're letting that connection be set up in advance I think that doesn't require a change in the law, as I understand it anyway. 
Would, would other member would other members of the panel like to comment on that? Natalie, you're unmuted. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I was just going to say, I think there's also a kind of practical question about the fact that all these kind of new uh, genetic websites like 23andMe and so on that we're hearing about, already now people are making connections with donors and donor conceived siblings and, you know, and sometimes not even directly with the people involved, but via other relatives. So, you know, the, the ways of people finding each other and finding this information is out there and it's growing very, very fast. And I think it's not going to be very many years before people can, you know, they don't have to worry about the regulated system at all. They'll be able to find each other completely independently. So I guess the question is, you know, whether we want to provide a regulated system in order to make sure that things are done in a more sensible way and that people have access to counselling if they need it, that, you know, approaches are made, you know, sensitively as, as possible. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to be careful about not getting too bogged down in, you know, what's law and what's policy and how it needs to be done and making sure that we, we're kind of keeping pace with what's happening anyway. Um, because I think, you know, these this information sharing is going to happen and it's really about do we provide an alternative that's that kind of regulated kind of sensible way of managing it um, I, I think there's the HFEA and clinics are very reluctant to make changes some of the changes can be done through policy they don't require law change but even if they do require law change I think you know it has to be a priority if we need to keep up with what's going on in the world anyway I think I absolutely agree with that, Natalie. What one hundred percent? Yeah, I, I think certainly our participation in, in events like this makes us recognise and and see where change is needed. And I think Selena and I would be open to sort of going back and sharing this with with our, with our colleagues and and making sure we take that into account. But you're absolutely right. We know when we talk to our patients, our, our sorry, our donors and our patients about. The, the ability to trace people through genetic testing. So we know that that's happening. We we talk to people about it. I think for me, the the hardest thing about that, because it, it feels really beguiling, doesn't it? Uh, as Leah said, to imagine actually, because you know how slow the law change would be, even if they agreed to do it today, it would take us ages. But it feels really beguiling to think actually, you know what, we don't need them to do this. If, if someone is motivated and wants to, they can find out they can make those links probably but at the same time you've still got people who maybe don't want to you know within the cohort the people that probably engage i don't know Leah and petra might have a sense of this you know very engaged donors are are they more likely to have engaged with this study and and participated so are we seeing a, a set of views from those people who who would like more information who are really keen and feel that special connection are is there a cohort of people out there who wouldn't want someone to connect them and who, who connect with them and would be truly horrified if it happened and how how do we balance all those different needs and I'm not saying I, I just genuinely don't know and I know we as I'm sure Selena and I will go back and think oh crikey what do we need to do differently but, but I, I think there's a there's a big difference isn't there between information being shared with consent and you know imposing a change in the rules on people where yeah. they don't have a say in that so you know changing the, the law in 2005 to require donors to be identifiable so they no longer have the option of being anonymous yeah. was an imposition whereas if you've got a donor saying i'd like you to pass this information on and the recipients say i'd like to receive it I think sometimes we get too hung up on the confidentiality overriding what people actually want so I think kind of being very clear about well, what can we do if people individually want more information and you know what's what's permitted is a separate question almost to you know what rights should the law impose and that is going to take longer and require more effort to change yeah I, I find the model the idea of having different you know you, you get to choose you could still choose to be an anonymous donor if you wanted to, or you could choose to be an identity release donor or an identity release donor plus who who wants to contact. I, I find I would find that a really amazing system, and I don't think it would be that difficult to to operate actually. Thank you. We're we're out of time as it happens. Um, I'm just wondering. I haven't I haven't warned them I'm going to do this, but I wonder if Petra or Leah or both of you would like to make some a closing kind of comment on the basis of some of the discussion that's been had there, there've been some there's been so much so many interesting ideas discussed and raised and there's lots more on the chat that we haven't been able to include but i wonder if i could just ask one or both of you to just make a, a closing comment 
Absolutely. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and thanks, everyone, for your comments. I can't, as you can imagine, I haven't been able to keep up with everything on the chat, but I, I, we're going to copy it so that I can afterwards see what's been going on. Uh, and it's really delightful to have you all here and, and engaging with you. I just wish we were in the same room so we could actually have more of these conversations. Um, I find it incredibly interesting to hear, not being a lawyer or you know, a, a legal person at all myself. It's really interesting to hear, to talk to people, policymakers, as, um, or people working much closer to policy than, than I do and that we tend to do as sociologists, to see the sort of, um, to understand much better about the sort of the, the, the ramifications and the, the sort of the difficulties as well as the opportunities that exist in, within the current setup. So I'm really grateful for the panel uh, for, for having this conversation just now. And I want to say thank you very much to all the speakers who have joined us. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that one day we will be able to meet and we will be able to have the event that was originally planned with people from overseas and so on. Uh, and hopefully one day we will be able to do that. But thank you very much uh, to everyone who joined us today, speakers as well as uh, participants. It's been thank great. You. Thank you. And before everybody goes, um, can I, Leah, did you want to say anything or shall I? You don't have to. <laughs> Only thank you to everyone. It's been a really interesting discussion. Really fascinated by your questions. And actually, it's been interesting to see how much that we actually all agree on, as well as, mm. you know, lots of ideas and provoking discussion and things. But I think there's been lots of, lots of agreement as well, which has been, yeah, great. Really interesting. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Well, before you all go, I did just want to thank all of the speakers and the panel members uh, and, and to Petra and Leah for putting together such a great event and also such a great panel because it's been really fascinating to hear the, hear the different perspectives. Um, and also, as I said at the beginning, to our media services people for making it happen. A big thank you to Christine Turner for making the organisational um, thing happen. Um, so thank you everybody and thank you for your questions and your chat and your comments which have been been fascinating and as Petra says they will be looked at in more detail because it, it all happens so quickly on Zoom. I think that's everything that there is to say except thank you everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and goodbye. <laughs>